Um, this is our last week in our Luke series. It's kind of hard to believe we've been doing this since December. Um, and why would we spend so much time with such a long sermon series, you ask? Because um, it's awesome. I heard somebody say that. Correct answer. <laughs> um, well, a big part of it is because, like, Jesus is the representation of the Father. Like, if we know Jesus, if we know what his commands are for our lives, if we know uh, the way, we see the way that he treated people, we see the things that he asked of us, that he commanded of us, we know the heart of the Father. We know what we were created for, what the good life truly is. And so to immerse ourselves in the life of Jesus is worth all the time that we can give to it. Uh, and just think about this. Like, this is a good question to ask ourselves. Like, what have you learned about the character of God from Jesus as we've been going through this series in Luke. I'd encourage you to be pondering that. Uh, because, you know, we all come from different places. We come from different backgrounds, different stories, uh, different upbringings. Uh, and so when Jesus speaks to us, or when we're introduced to these stories about him, it connects with our hearts in different ways. Uh, and that's true of all of us here in this room. It's true about human beings all throughout history. It's true of the characters that we run into, even in chapter 23, uh, which we're going to be looking at today. Uh, chapter 23 is Luke's uh, portrayal of the crucifixion and all the events that were surrounding it. Uh, and I think one of the things that's really interesting that, that stood out to me with chapter 23 is just how many colorful characters we meet all along the way with this. And so we're going to kind of be paraphrasing chapter 23, and we're going to be looking at all these different people that we meet along the way, because they're all seeing Jesus being crucified, and yet there's just about as many reactions to that crucifixion as there are people in the story, too. And I think uh, that's almost kind of like they serve as a microcosm or like a sampling of humanity, uh, how we react, how we respond to Jesus. And this is what Luke wants us to be considering as we finish up here. So the first group of people that we run into uh, at the end of chapter 22, but at the beginning of chapter 23 also, is the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish High Council. And they're made up of elders of the people, they're made up of the leading priests, and the teachers of the law. Um, these are the, the heads of the religious establishment. Uh, and, you know, Jesus has been butting heads with these guys all the way through the Gospel of Luke, uh, because Jesus is a threat to their system. Like these people are supposed to be the experts in everything that there is to know about God. Like they know the law of Moses. They know God's will for his people. And so they shepherd the people and the people listen to them. And so ironically, when God himself shows up to them in the flesh, they reject him. And they want to kill him. Like truth incarnate standing before them. And, and uh, in order to get rid of him, what do they do? They lie. They stretch the truth and they put words in Jesus' mouth. They're saying, you know, he's going around and he's causing riots among the people. Like in, the Jew, in that world, like around Jerusalem and Judea, uh, it was like a powder keg, a political powder keg. Like, and it was always ready to erupt with just chaos, right? And so the Romans needed to keep control of that place. And then they were saying that Jesus was going around and telling people like, like you shouldn't be paying your taxes to Caesar, uh, which that's not true. They have to tell these lies. And I think one of the important things for us to notice is that um, just because people are in religious positions of authority and teach the Bible, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're on the right page here. And this is something that I think, you know, we've repeated this a lot here, and it's important to me because I think I see younger generations of people uh, who have been manipulated by people in the name of Jesus Christ, and it's causing them to flee away from the churches. I've seen people who have been manipulated, good, wonderful people, uh, by these kinds of voices. And this is why it's so important for us to know Jesus. It's so important for us to know what he taught and how he treated people. Because if we're not clear about that, we can be manipulated pretty easily because it happens all the time. We see that happening here. So there, there's the high council. Uh, and then there's Pilate. See, these guys want to stamp out Jesus, but there's a problem. Like, you can't just go do that. You need to have Rome's official stamp of approval. And so Pontius Pilate is the governor of that area. Um, he, he's a violent, brutal person. 
Uh, and so they need to get his approval to have Jesus crucified. And so they go to Pilate with all of their lies, and they bring Jesus before him. And Pilate's looking at Jesus, and he's going, wait a second. This guy? Like, this is the guy that you're so threatened by? Like, he's silent. He doesn't really say anything. I don't see, like, a whole, like, military brigade of people behind him, you know? Like, he's just got, like, this ragtag group of people following him. And so he keeps saying, this guy's innocent, I'm going to let him go. But the Jewish people are really upset with him, these leaders, these Sanhedrin. And they're saying, look, Pilate, if you don't have this guy crucified, you are an enemy of the state. Because you know what's going on here. This guy's telling people you don't have to pay your taxes. He's causing chaos here in Rome. He's causing rioting. He's claiming to be a king. Like, that's, that's seditious. That's treason. And if you don't stop this, like... You're not doing your job. And they kind of have a point. But even though he, uh, he sees that he's innocent, uh, he cares more about his power. He cares about his influence and his control. And he's willing to allow an innocent person uh, to be crucified, if that's what it takes. That, that's kind of like the power-hungry politician thing that we see happening with a person like Pilate. And then we meet Herod Antipas as well. And he's not all that much better. Um, during Jesus' phony trial before Pilate, uh, Pilate doesn't really want to have anything to do with this. He, he's looking for an opportunity to get away. Then he finds out that Jesus is from Galilee. And he says, oh, okay, well, Herod Antipas, like that, that's his jurisdiction. So I'm just going to pass the buck onto him, and then he'll have to deal with this Jesus stuff. And Luke tells us earlier in his gospel that Herod looked forward to meeting Jesus. Because he had heard about like all these stories of his authoritative teaching and, and these miraculous things that he's doing in the world. And so Herod's thinking, this is it. Like, I get to see the magic show now. And so Jesus comes in and is brought before him. And uh, Herod is underwhelmed. He's even disappointed. Because it's like, come on. I mean, think about, like, back in Egypt, like, the story of Moses, like, he throws a staff on the ground and turns to snakes. Like, do something cool like that. Like, heal somebody. But Jesus doesn't even talk. He doesn't say a word. And so Herod decides to uh, fill the awkward silence with him and his soldiers mocking him. And they put a, a royal robe on him. Yeah, some Messiah, huh? And then, they, I mean, can you just imagine, like, the jeering and the joking, and, and they just shove him back to Pilate. And so Pilate continues uh, his grilling of him and continues to see him as innocent. Uh, but the, the Jewish leaders are saying, no, crucify him, crucify him. And they're not the only ones. We also see this crowd of people all through chapter 23. And the crowd is kind of a mixed bag. There are some in the crowd that are sympathizers to Jesus. Uh, but there's a number of them uh, who don't like Jesus. And, and I think part of that is just because, like, that's what their religious leaders are telling them to do. That's what their shepherds are saying. Like, this guy's dangerous. He says he's a Messiah, but he's not. And so we need to have him crucified. And they go along with it, you know. They start to get into the mob mentality along with them and start shouting, crucify him, crucify him as well. And then there's a really interesting character that we run into named Barabbas. Um, Matthew... And Mark tell us that uh, it, was, it was a custom back then, uh, every year during the Passover, that the governor would release a prisoner to the Jewish people, anybody that they wanted to have released to them. Um, and have, have you seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? Uh, that's kind of a helpful movie, right? Like it really helps us to see just like how horrible the things were that Jesus went through. But, but I, I take issue with the way that Barabbas is portrayed in that movie, okay? Because they show him as just this, like, bloodthirsty psychopath that he's just like, eh, eh, you know, like foaming at the mouth. Like, he has no control over his violent impulses, right? Um, like, he's just this crazed lunatic. But that's not the case, okay? Listen to what Luke says. It says, Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government and for murder. Now, prior to January 6th, 2001, I would imagine that the word insurrection didn't mean a whole lot to us. But like now we've seen it. 
We've seen what it looks like on the news, okay? And, and regardless of how you feel about that, I mean, let's just think about what an insurrection is. It's when there's a popular movement of people that don't agree with when the people in power are making certain decisions, and so they decide that they're going to take matters into their own hands. And here on our soil, it, was, it looks like storming the Capitol, right? Uh, and so this is like what Barabbas would have been like. Like, he was, he was one that was fighting against the Romans, with everybody else. And so like he wasn't this crazed lunatic for the Jewish people. He was a freedom fighter. He was a hero. They didn't want him to be in prison in the first place. And here's a little interesting tidbit too about Barabbas. Um, His name means son of the father. Uh, Bar, son of, and then you've probably heard Abba means father. So there's two sons of the father here in this scene that we get to choose from. Which one do we want released? And the people don't like Jesus. What kind of Messiah or king is he? Like, he teaches other people to go and and to buddy-buddy up with the Romans, to love them. To, to heal their loved ones, to carry their pack an extra mile, to develop relationships with them. Like, but we want him killed. Like, these people don't want a Jesus. They, they don't want a, a son of the Father like that. They want one that's like William Wallace. They want one that's like John Wayne. They want one that's like Barabbas here. Like Quentin Tarantino. Just take revenge on our enemies. Take them out. That's what they're looking for. We... Human beings, friends, we're a vengeful people. We're a violent people with little patience for the work of reconciliation that Jesus is calling us into. And we will often, if not maybe always, choose Barabbas over Jesus. And if you think about it too, Barabbas was actually guilty of the things that they were accusing Jesus of. He's treasonous, he's seditious, he's an enemy of the state. Well, that's what Barabbas actually was. But as long as he's our enemy of the state, then it's okay, right? I mean, this is like the definition of tribe over truth, what we see here. Jesus dies in his place, the innocent for the guilty. And then we have uh, Simon of Cyrene. Is this microphone working? It feels like it just cut out. Maybe I'll just switch to this thing, huh? Check, 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 check. Okay, good. Beautiful. Thanks, guys. You're good. Uh, Simon of Cyrene. So Barabbas is released to them. Uh, And then all of a sudden they they say, okay, we'll give Jesus to the angry mob. You guys do whatever you want with him. And so while Jesus is being brought to Golgotha where he's going to be crucified, uh, the Roman soldiers just pick a random person out of the crowd. And they say, all right, you're going to carry this guy's cross. And there has to be echoes of Jesus' teachings here, too, when he says to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. This is what it looks like. And there's more ordinary people here, too. uh, And that's the women that we see in the crowd. Because you see, Jesus is always dignifying people that, in like culturally or societally, they just don't matter. They're unimportant. And that was women in that time. They just didn't have a voice. Like, it was men that called the shots. And yet here, uh, they're being lifted up as the people who are the models of the kind of faith that Jesus asked of all of his followers. And one of the commentators that I've been reading, his name's Justo Gonzalez. And he says in his commentary on Luke, in these last two chapters of Luke's gospel, It will be women who wail for him on his way to the crucifixion, women whom Luke will single out as standing among the crowd, women who will accompany his body to the tomb, women who will first learn of his resurrection, and women who will be first to carry the news to the apostles. The last will be first. This is is the value system of God's kingdom. And then there's the two criminals that we meet too. Um, at the end of chapter 2, uh, Jesus 
looked at the words of Isaiah and applied them to himself, that he would be counted among the rebels. Uh, now, crucifixion in the Roman Empire, like these guys, like we're said they're criminals. Uh, maybe some of them say robbers or whatever, depending on the translation that you're looking at, thieves. Um, but these guys aren't just like pickpocketing and then being crucified for. They, they were probably more like a Barabbas type person. They, they must have done something violent, something that was very anti-Roman, uh, because what the Romans would do is they would reserve crucifixion for the people who were going to be anti-Rome. Like when Rome says, here's the parameters, here's the rules, as long as you live within them, you're fine. But you go outside of them, and you work against us, and we will strip you naked, we will torture you, and we will nail you to a cross in front of everybody. It, it's a terror tactic that they use to keep people in line. And so these guys must have done something awful. Uh, and so they're crucified one on either side of Jesus, which kind of like goes back to, remember when James and John were fighting about the positions on his right and his left, and Jesus is like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Well, now, now we see where that was going there. And although uh, both of these guys, they're in the exact same situation, the exact same scenario, they both respond to Jesus very differently in this circumstance. Uh, the one of them just joins the mocking of Jesus along with everybody else. And, and one of the main insults that everybody was throwing at Jesus is just like, ha, some Messiah, right? You know, like you saved all these other people and you can't even get yourself off the cross. Like save yourself Sa and save us maybe while you're at it. I mean, these criminals have no respect for Jesus because... They're expecting the Messiah to be that John Wayne type person, that William Wallace, that Barabbas, that Quentin Tarantino revenge kind of thing. That's the expectations. But Jesus seems pathetic and vulnerable in this place. It's not what Messiahs do. And like bullies on the playground, they just pick on the kid that is maybe saying, oh, I'm going to be a good basketball player. And just, they're like, no, nah, dude, you're a nerd. Get out of here. I mean, that's, that's kind of like what everybody has toward Jesus. But except for the other criminal. There's something about him that he said, no, nah, th there's something about this Jesus guy. And he rebukes his fellow criminal and says, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Jesus, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And there's a lot of times with Jesus we see this like people when they just want to manipulate them. They just want to mock them. They've already made up their minds. Their hearts, hearts are hardened toward them. Jesus doesn't really engage them. But when people actually come with, to him with a purity of heart, uh, he'll engage them. He'll talk to them. He'll listen to what they have to say. And Jesus says to them, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And then we get the Roman officer overseeing Jesus' execution. Um, it's getting to be toward the end of the day and around noon until about 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, darkness falls over the whole land. Like the sun doesn't shine anymore. And the curtain of the temple, we're told, is torn in two. And with Jesus' dying breath, he shouts out, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Like even at Jesus' darkest hour, when there was really no reason to have any hope left, death is only a breath away. Jesus expressed his unyielding trust to his Father even to the bitter end. That dying breath, like when you should be giving up, like he's just like, no, I trust him. Even in my death, I trust that he's going to have his way here. And Jesus dies. And who is the first person to recognize that they had made a terrible mistake and killed an innocent man of God? It's the Roman executioner. I mean, the Romans, the, this is the arch nemesis of the Jewish people. And not only that, but this, this particular guy, his job was to make sure that Jesus suffered terribly. That he was tortured and that he would die. And Luke tells us that upon Jesus' death and his last words, the executioner worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. 
I mean, imagine being a Jewish person and hearing Luke's gospel for the first time. Like this pagan Roman Gentile is the first person to worship God in the fullness of the truth as he's been revealed in Jesus Christ on the cross. That's, that's just unheard of. And apparently that angry mob that was so bloodthirsty during that time, something must have changed for some of them too. Maybe it was the darkness, maybe it was the temple, the curtain being torn, maybe just seeing Jesus die because it says that they went home in deep sorrow. And then there's one last character uh, that's really interesting that Luke introduces us to at the end of chapter 23. His name is Joseph of Arimathea. And he was a member of that Jewish council, uh, of the Sanhedrin. Like the group of people that, like, they're responsible for Jesus' death. They're the ones that said, like, we need to have him crucified. And they lied and they brought him before Pilate and did everything that they could uh, to manipulate the circumstances so that Jesus would be killed in this situation. These are the ones that were butting heads with Jesus all the time. And this guy, Joseph, said, we are wrong. What we're doing is wrong. Luke tells us that he was good and righteous, that he was awaiting the kingdom of God to come, and that he had not agreed with the decisions and the actions of his fellow religious leaders. And this showed in that uh, after Jesus' body, after he had died and his body still on the cross, he went to Pilate and asked, can I have the body? Because he wanted to give him a proper, dignified burial. I mean, can you imagine the guts of this guy? Seriously. Because you got your own group and you see how violent they are. You see that they'll go to any lengths to make sure that they get what they want, even if it means crucifying an innocent person. And not only that, too, but when he goes to Pilate uh, and he asks for the body, I mean, this is a, a person that the Roman state has said, no, this guy's a criminal. And so now you are associating yourself with him. So all your fellow Jewish people are going to be looking at you with suspicion. And the Roman Empire is saying, like, you're sympathizing with an enemy of the state. I mean, this is a, a relationship-ending, career-ending move that he's making here. But you know what? This, he lives out the epitome of truth over tribe. Because it matters more about the truth than lying in order to continue to be accepted and have a good reputation. If only we had more leaders like that in the world. Amen. <laughs> These are the characters we meet in chapter 23. There's so many of them, right? They're all, they're all over the place. All different backgrounds, all different social status, all different allegiances, all different religious traditions, and, and all the other kind of different categories that separate us as human beings. And you know, Jesus' world, it, it's not really that different than our world today. We live in a super diverse world, a globalized world, where we just, you know, like we're so much more aware of all the different cultures uh, and all the different people uh, and value systems of this world. And you know, any of us here in this room could have been part of that story of Jesus' crucifixion, characters in that story. But as different as we are, there's something that we all have in common. All of us. Throughout time and history, space, cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds, whatever. And that is that Jesus prays over all of us. Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. I mean, can you think of anything more evil and horrible that we as human beings and the systems of our world could do other than to torture and to crucify the creator of the world and the flesh? Like, that's dark. That is absolutely the darkest thing that we could possibly do. And how does God respond to it? He doesn't send in angels and just go and hack up everybody that opposed him. He doesn't rain down fire and brimstone. Instead, he forgives. And he, invite, he keeps the door open for people to repent, for reconciliation to happen, so that they can become participants in what he's doing in this world, in his kingdom. He can continue to go and to bless others. 
And this forgiveness, friends, it's for everybody. I mean, Jesus prayed that for the people in the crowd as he's hanging there from the cross. Think of the characters that we met. Uh, That forgiveness is offered to corrupt religious uh, teachers that oppose Jesus around every turn. It's given to violent, power-hungry politicians like Pilate and Herod. It's given to the crowds of people who are manipulated into suppressing the truth. To insurrectionists like Barabbas, who hate their enemies so much that they'd be willing to kill them. To insignificant and ordinary people like Simon of Cyrene, or the women in the story. To people who are sentenced to the death penalty, like the criminals. And to the executioner, whose job it was to stamp out human life. It's to you. It's to me. It's to the people that we despise. There is literally nothing that you can do that is outside of the redemptive power of Jesus' forgiveness. That is radical. I mean, Jesus prayed forgiveness for all. And why? Because he genuinely loves each and every single one of us. We're so sacred to him. We're so valuable to him. And because God created the human heart, because Jesus has walked in our shoes and understands what it means to be human, like all the trials and the temptations that we've gone through, he's got a wisdom and an insight into us. Like God, God has a, a realism about human beings. He knows the way that we're wired. He sees the evil that we do, and he knows that we do it in ignorance. And because God understands us, he has this just incredible patience and kindness toward all of us in our ignorance. Like, because like, if we had the eyes to see, if we had the ears to hear, the beauty of what God has actually created us for. We wouldn't do the horrible things to God that we do. We wouldn't do the horrible things to each other or to ourselves that we do. And this is why Jesus can pray, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Or as we read over and over in the Psalms, the Lord is gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He's good to all. And the question for us all then that Luke I think wants us to see is do we recognize it? God is extending this gift of forgiveness to humanity. Will we receive it? Or will we harden our hearts and will we reject it? And we see that happening right here in the story, right? You know, you, you got the religious leaders that to the very end, I don't care. I want him dead. Good, he's dead. But then among them, you have Joseph of Arimathea. Like, there's nobody that's beyond redemption. These are Jesus, like the people that struggle to get along with them the very most. And even he can be part of it. Or you get the criminals on the cross. I mean, literally, there's one that just, he doesn't, he's like shouting at Jesus on his deathbed. But then there's the other one that's crying out to Jesus on his deathbed. It's never too late to receive his forgiveness, no matter what you've done. It's a radical kind of love that he has for us. But for those who are persistent in slandering Jesus and resisting his radical way of love and mercy and kindness and compassion and gentleness and forgiveness, they're going to get what they want. Life apart from Jesus and from his new creation. God doesn't force people to choose him. But for those who recognize and receive God's forgiveness, they've begun a journey with Jesus that's on a hard road. It's a road that leads through a cross. And you ask anybody, especially Jesus, like, the cross was not fun. It was not comfortable, but it was the way that ended up leading to life for the rest of the world, for eternity. Now, today, in this life, but also in the future to come. It's a life where uh, today we're learning to allow our hearts to beat more in sync 
with his heart. Or as John tells us, to, to walk the way that Jesus walked in the rest of the world. And as we start to learn this about Jesus, like we, we, we learn to see God. We learn to see reality. We learn to see all other human beings. We learn to see ourselves. We learn to see everything through his lens and through his eyes. And so even when the world is crucifying us, we can literally, from within our bones, by the power of the Holy Spirit, actually mean it when we echo his prayer and say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And from the world's perspective, uh, this is crazy. It's laughable. You know, what kind of a Messiah dies forgiving his enemies? And the crucifixion just seems to say, see, it's stupid. It doesn't work that way. But you keep reading on to chapter 24, and Easter happens, and the resurrection. And we see that a life of Christ-like love and forgiveness is actually the most powerful force to be reckoned with in the world. And not even evil, and Satan, and darkness, and death have any power over it. It reigns victorious in the resurrection and the new creation to come. And Jesus wants us to choose, or, well, Jesus does too, but Luke is inviting us to choose this life, to respond to this invitation that's given to us all, that all are forgiven, and they're gladly welcomed into a better way, into a better kingdom, the way under King Jesus and in the kingdom of God. His way of structuring human relationships. His way of ordering the world. Amen? Amen. Let us choose Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, God. There is no one like you. Uh, to leave it all and to come to us in our brokenness, in our um, distraction and our stubbornness and our hard-heartedness and to invite us to come and to follow you. And even when we reject, we reject you, we turn our backs on you, we want to choose our own way, uh, we hurl insults against you, we spit on you. You continue to go to the cross for us. You didn't have to do it, but you love. You love, you love. And Lord, we're nothing without your sacrifice. But you keep the door open to us, and so we thank you, God. And we just come before you all as beggars uh, and with such gratitude for your love and your forgiveness. And Lord, I pray that as we receive it, that we would not take it for granted, but that we would open our hearts to learn to forgive the way that you forgive so that we can be peacemakers here in this world, that we can keep the door of your kingdom open, that we uh, not be like the religious leaders that claim to speak for God but shut the door on the rest of the world, but the ones that look like you, Jesus, that we too might honestly, by the power of your Spirit, be able to join you in prayer for the people in our world and say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. We thank you that we're not alone in this. We thank you that um, there have been faithful people throughout history, people like Luke, uh, who took the pains to write this stuff down so that we can receive it uh, and just allow you, Spirit, to work on our hearts. I pray, uh, Jesus, that you would work on each and every single one of us in our unique circumstances and our unique places, that you would draw us nearer to you uh, so that we would long for you, that we would love you, that we would want you to speak into our lives uh, so that you can show us the way. Show us the true way to live, the way that we're all looking for, the good life, Lord. We love you, God, and thank you that you want us to know you. Um, and so I just pray for everyone here, Lord, uh, that we would not be led into temptation, that we would keep our eyes fixed on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, if you need prayer during the final song, uh, there will be people over there. Naomi's right there ready for you. Maybe you need prayers for forgiveness, because that's hard for us to apply to ourselves sometimes. Amen.